Hi, I'm Tom Burgess and welcome to The Real Agenda, where we look at inequality, poverty and unnecessary hardship that's suffered by millions every day and how we can work together to create a more compassionate and just society. We look at the answers, not just discuss the problems. So thanks for joining us for this second series, second episode in Series 4. I'm Gavin Esler, and I want to see in Britain a more compassionate and just society. And that's one of the reasons I listen to The Real Agenda. So what's the big deal about Davos? Or is it just about big deals? What really is the point of this annual January gathering in the snow of the rich and influential? What progress has it made? I was interested to hear that Richard Curtis, the film and TV producer, you know, Love Actually, Notting Hill, Vicar of Dibley, he goes to Davos as it gives him an opportunity to talk about the causes he supports and those that can have influence and cash, that with those that have influence and cash. And today's guest went to Davos with a placard saying tax the rich and a letter to the delegates on behalf of the self-styled patriotic millionaires. Now his name is Phil White and he is a patriotic millionaire, a growing band of wealthy and super wealthy people who would like to see better public services and effective government by taxing the wealthy more. So I started by asking Phil why he went to Davos. The thing about Davos is you've got such a concentration of wealth there and effectively you've got millionaires, billionaires flying in, in private jets, which is another issue, really talking about how they see the world being run in the future. And, you know, they're not democratically elected. They're just there because they have wealth. And so really I was there to draw attention to that and to actually argue for wealth taxes and argue that we need to reduce that role and that influence of wealth in society today, which is, you know, endemic in society and I think very corrosive, actually. So I, so I was there really trying to get attention, trying to get media attention in particular around the fact that we have these unelected people in society who really have undue influence on the future of the world and the future of their countries. So do you get invited to go or do you just go? No, no, no. I, and I was very much outside in the streets, um, in the snow. And I, I mean, I joined the, the various protests there. There was a climate demonstration there, um, again, at the effect that wealth has on climate. Um, I joined that group of people for a while. But again, the main message I was getting across was we need to increasingly tax the rich and reduce wealth inequality but no i wasn't invited i wasn't inside the forum i was i was outside the forum looking for media attention but you did present a, a letter who did you from <laughs> patriotic millionaires who did you present that to yes we did and that was presented to the world economic forum delegates um and we did the same last year last year it was addressed to the the chair and again that's really trying to get this message home that everybody needs to work together. So the, the thrust of the letter was actually it's time that the wealthy paid more tax and that the wealthy contributed more to society. And so the message was to the delegates to really get behind this message. If you know, you're serious about these good statements that you make in the World Economic Forum, and there are good statements about poverty and climate and so on, but if you're serious about that, then you also need to get serious about paying for it and paying for it through elected government and through taxation and through wealth taxation in particular, because otherwise they're just empty statements. So what, what is the problem with wealth, or should I say extreme wealth? Several problems associated with extreme wealth, I think. Um, firstly, I mean, there's a, just the straightforward economic one, that you know, wealth it doesn't exist in a vacuum. One person's wealth is another person's cost of living crisis, and we need to be very clear about that. And we can't you know, have a large part of society just doing well or doing badly and assuming that wealth is somehow a separate phenomenon. These are linked. And so if we look at what happened in the pandemic, when you know, the government very rightly put a lot of money into furlough schemes and so on to help people, to support people who were out of work or you know, had to work from home or whatever, to support people that you know, couldn't continue with their normal employment then actually that wealth flowed up, flowed up to the wealthy. The money the government put in flowed up to the wealthy 
and it sat there. And so what we've got is this, this economic issue now where a lot of money went in. We're now seeing inflation for a number of reasons, including that. And yet we can't take that money back. So there's an economic issue there. There's also an economic issue in that, you know, the government needs money to pay for services, pay for public services. And we take a lot of money from people who really can't afford it at the moment to do that through national insurance, VAT and so on. Um, and actually, we should be taxing well just to solve that very simple economic problem. So that's, that's the first level. But then there's a whole bunch of sort of social and democratic issues around that. And if we look democratically, then wealth has undue influence. And we see, you know, the government today, actually individual members of the government today are very wealthy. And that affects their thinking. It affects how they behave. We see lobbying from rich institutions, lobbying from wealth, really influencing the policies of the UK. So that takes us away from the point where governments are acting for the people that elect them and pushes us towards a system where government's acting for the wealthy in the interests of the wealthy. So that's the sort of democratic issue there, which is a very big democratic issue. And then, of course, you know, we've got a whole bunch of social issues as well, because wealth divides the country at the end of the day. And we have the haves and the have nots. And if we see you know, people really struggling, growth in food banks, situation in the UK where we have more food banks and branches than McDonald's now. And so, you know, again, that can't be right. But then we've got people and, you know, high private sector salaries, boards of directors increasing their salaries disproportionately. That's divisive and, again, corrosive in society. So there are those, you know, three issues, if you like. There's the economic, there's the democratic, and there's the social level. And those all need attention, and they, they need attention by taxing wealth. Absolutely. And so, I mean, one of the issues also, isn't it, that the media, uh, particularly the media and indeed politicians and, uh, and others, sort of confuse income and wealth? Because when they say, are we not going to cut taxes, or we are going to cut taxes, or not going to increase taxes, if we increase taxes on income, it causes big problems. If we increase taxes on wealth, it doesn't cause any problem. No, ab absolutely, because, you know, wealth is sitting there, um, some of it's sitting as cash in banks, some of it's sitting as shares in companies, and so on. But actually, you know, the government can do really useful things with that wealth. And, you know, the numbers that we look at within patriotic billionaires, you know, talk about fairly simple wealth taxes around actually taxing standing wealth, um, equalising the tax on dividend income and so on with, with um, work, worked income, um, dealing with capital gains tax, a bit. These, all these sorts of issues. You could get tens of billions of pounds out of that. And that, at the end of the day, frankly, doesn't hurt anybody. Everybody who can afford those taxes. It's not as if we're taking money and meaning they're going to struggle with next week's meals. Um, so, yeah, those taxes are affordable by the people they'd be levied on. And that's where we're coming from with patriotic millionaires. We're saying, you know, look, we can afford to pay higher taxes. We can afford to pay taxes on our wealth. So come on, Mr. Sunak. Come on, Mr. Chancellor. Come and tax us. And why don't they do it? I think that's a very complicated question. I'm sure there are risk, a, a list of motivations there. One is, I think, very simply that they are wealthy themselves. You know, their natural inclination is to act in favour of the people they know and understand, their peers and so on. So I think there's a probably a real lack of understanding of just how difficult things are out there and how wealth taxes can make a difference and why it would be right. Um, I think, I secondly... It, I think, comes down to the, the lobbying and media influence. Um, and again, the right-wing press talks you know, very much about effectively how this picture of wealth taxes being evil in some way. But you know, that is a picture put about by a very small minority of people. And when we talk about wealth taxes, you know, we need to be clear. We're not absolutely not talking about you know, stopping people passing on their home to their children or whatever. You know, we're talking about extreme wealth here, and that's the top 1% of society. And so that's a, a wealth of uh, four million pounds or more, basically, in the UK. I don't understand why governments would think that's not an acceptable thing to do. Because, and again, polling that we've done, when we talk to people, when we've had polls carried out for us, 
say that actually the majority of people in this country would welcome a wealth tax at that level and would see it as a good thing, again, both in terms of fairness and who broad shoulders, who contributes more, um, and also just in terms of long term, it just feels the right thing to do because the wealthy don't pay the same sort of proportion of their, their, money, their wealth and income on taxation as the lower paid. And so there's a strong feeling in the country that a wealth tax is good, and yet the government doesn't implement that. And that's, that is difficult to understand. It certainly is difficult to understand. You might expect the, the Labour Party, for example, to be pushing that. But I think even, yeah, I, uh, even with them, they're, they're worried that if they push it, they'll get sort of labelled the politics of envy and, and all these sort of things, and, and therefore tend to, to hold back on doing it, and also don't really understand you know, what you've just explained, that the, there is a connection between wealth and poverty and, you know, the fact that taxes would make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, again, I can see, you know, there would be real opposition if we put a wealth tax in at low levels, started taxing wealth at 100k or something, then, yeah, we'd see real, real opposition to that. But again, when we do look at, you know, some wealth taxes and inheritance tax, for example, is one, you know, and that does affect sort of a, a lot of people, it affects more than the top 1%. You know, one could adjust thresholds, you know, one could look at increasing that lower threshold perhaps to take more people out of that inheritance tax and increasing the top rate, again, to really focus on the super wealthy and extreme wealth. Um, so, you know, there are, there are ways of making that actually more acceptable. And I'm surprised the Labour Party isn't more interested in that, frankly. One thing that's always said with politicians, you know, there's no votes in um, taxation. And hence, you know, calls for tax reform have just not happened. You know, even if you go to council tax and things like that, why have not happened? And uh, Indeed. I, I would yeah. think there's huge votes in taxation, particularly what, you know, we're talking about today. Well, if you can, uh, you know, explain that, you know, taxation pays for things. So there are no, there may be no votes in taxation, but there are a lot of votes in the health service. There's a lot of, there are a lot of votes in, you know, decent public transport, decent public services. Um, and, you know, I think as a country, we're well developed. Our average ledge level of income and wealth is high. Actually, on average, we're fine. But some people are really struggling and other people are super wealthy. And actually, if the government can articulate that linkage and articulate the fact that actually probably the most important thing to people most people is their health and their well-being their environment and so on then actually there's a message there that can say well if we if that's the new social contract if that's what we want then we're going to have to pay for this and let's look at how we do that have a conversation about it but at the end of the day frankly the only place it can come from is the wealthy because they've got all the money well, would, exactly. And would you say that, you know, in fact, really, we all create the wealth because we're all contributing to it, but the system means it's accumulated by a few? I would do. And the, you know, and again, we do get this pushback against wealth taxes that say, well, the wealthy would take their money abroad, that would reduce the economic productivity of the country and the economic output and so on. But what isn't articulated with, along with that is actually, you know, exhausted workers, exploited workers, people struggling to live day to day is hitting productivity, hitting the economic output of the country and just hitting our social fabric. So by all means, we might see, you know, a small number of people take their capital elsewhere or whatever we need to protect against that. But actually, I think the much larger effect on the country would be a general rise in, in productivity and well-being of the workforce, if you like, so on economic grounds. I think we'd be a lot better off. And, you know, there are studies supporting that. Well, it seems to be a slight shift in people's views, but we need to take it a bit further, don't we? Because it's not, you know, at one stage it was considered sort of smart to avoid taxes, and uh, because there's a lot more effort to clamp down on this, if that's the right word, but, you know, to minimise it. Not enough by a long way, but, I mean, I think the, the, the thought that everybody, you know, those that are extremely wealthy will up sticks and leave with all their money, I think is... is not supportable because I mean well, as you said one or two may do but most people want to live in the country of their choice and you know they've got family absolutely. there and property there and businesses absolutely and if you know if people with 
wealth wanted a higher return on that wealth, they could move to Singapore or the USA today, but they don't do that. So is really a, a wealth tax of one, two, three, whatever percentage, is that really going to fundamentally change behavior? I find, I find that very unlikely, frankly. It just logically doesn't stack up when people could leave today and do better, but they don't. So how do we fix it then? What do what do we actually need to do? You know, if you were speaking to the prime minister tomorrow, what would you be proposing? I would be proposing specifically a tax on static wealth, a tax on wealth, and I would be pr proposing that tax on income from wealth, in whatever form, is a tax at least as highly as tax on earned income, so that we don't end up with this crazy situation where if somebody makes their income through dividends or capital gains or whatever, they get taxed on that less than somebody who's working hard for a living. Again, that seems odd. So, yes, I, I would do those. So tax on wealth and uh, a tax on income from wealth that brings it in to par with income from work. When you say static wealth, what, what do you mean? How would this operate? Would people create a, you know, an inventory of their wealth? Yeah, and there are complications about that because obviously – you know, the super wealthy, and there's a whole industry that supports this, the super wealthy do have ways of taking wealth offshore or investing offshore or whatever, and it's difficult to find that wealth sometimes, and it's difficult to tax it. So certainly land is a good starting point because, you know, land is very difficult to take land offshore without a very large digger. So that would be one start. And then I think, you know, we do need we need to get rid of the non-DOM status and the re other international issues that we need to deal with. So we do need international cooperation to actually stop people. So taxes on capital flight, for example, would be one thing. But yeah, so it is a complicated picture, but essentially you'd probably end up with a, an inventory or something. And, and this would take, take time. It's not something that's going to magically be solved tomorrow because it is complicated. But we need to move in that direction. You would include a sort of land value tax or as a, as a useful yeah. tool? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, all these things are, well, land is, is quite direct, but a lot of these things are proxies for wealth, um, and one needs to understand whether they're close proxies for overall wealth and so on. But yeah, certainly I, I, I would look at land as being an issue, and then you have to deal with the fact that, you know, land, you might be asset rich and cash poor, so you need to deal with those sorts of issues. But all this stuff can be dealt with if we actually take this step of saying, you know, this is what we want to do. This is our political goal. This has the support of the country. And so let's do this. And then we'll work out the wrinkles around the edges um, once we've decided how to do it, if you like. Well, I understand your group has actually sort of been through most of the objections and sort of um, taken them apart. They're not really, you know, yeah. to show that they don't actually, they're not actually an issue. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the, say the, the one that we come across most is this whole capital flight. And that comes back and back. There's very little evidence to support that theory. Again, it, it sounds like propaganda. You know, what we see there is this, again, un, as I said before, undue influence of the media. And you know, one example of that actually is on climate change, where numbers are more readily available. So, you know, what we see is that oil companies spending $200 million a year on lobbying against climate change legislation. And, you know, those oil companies are owned by the wealthy and they're lobbying against the interests of the countries for the benefit of their high value shareholders. There's a lot of this lobbying goes on to say it's easier to see in climate change because the figures are there. But the similar effects and occasionally one pops up in the whole wealth issues and lobbying against wealth taxes or lob lobbying against increased taxes. We address those arguments, we take them down they keep popping back up again, but at the end of the day, we're we're confident there isn't real substance in any of them, frankly. So who are the Patriotic Millionaires? Patriotic Millionaires US, which is a group actually chaired by Morris Pearl, who used to be um, BlackRock chair a um, few years back, now Patriotic Millionaires, so he's seen the light, if you like. In the UK, we're a group of a few tens of people at the moment. We've only been around about 18 months, but we're growing growing fast and we've got really a, a different sets of wealth different sources of wealth so we've got people with inherited wealth in that group we've got people who've been entrepreneurs and created companies and developed their wealth that way 
We've got people who've developed wealth through working. We've got people who are traders in the city and so on. So it's really a good cross section of different types of wealth. So we're not just representing, if you like, one particular um, set of people. So we're comfortable with that. But I say we're about 20, 30 people, um, probably more now, actually, near 40. And we're growing. Um, we've got some good, well known names in there. Um, Ian Gregg, for example, from Gregg's Bakers is there. Um, actors, people who run significant, you know, high street companies are in there. Some are, some are anonymous and don't like to be, have their names mentioned and they support. And I completely understand that. Others are happy to be public and talk to media and so on, um, like uh, in the same way that I do. So what's your background, Phil? I mean, how do you come to qualify to be a patriotic millionaire? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was an engineer, which typically is not a, not a route to fortune. And you know, I started off normal working class family. And I, but, you know, I was to some extent born at the right time. So I got a grant to go to university. I was effectively paid to go to university, which is very different to the situation we see today. Um, I worked in research and then I worked for a consultancy firm, became a partner in that in that firm. So effectively part owned the firm. Um, and then we sold the firm to private equity. Uh, and I made a lot of money through that process. Um, so that's, you know, I work for it, if you like. Um, and I was lucky and I was supported by a lot of people en route, um, which, you know, is another point here, because a lot of very wealthy people talk about being self-made. and This is my money. I made it. I want to keep it. But actually, nobody is self-made at the end of the day. You know, everybody needs some level of support. Everybody needs a society around them that helps them generate and use that wealth. You know, if we took away society from, you know, some, you know, super from Bezos or Musk or whatever, they wouldn't find life either very satisfying or economically very stable because they rely on society and, you know, governments build societies and they rely on that to, to use their wealth, to make their wealth in the first place. So, yeah, I know it is self-made. I wasn't self-made. I had you know, a lot of state support in education and resources and so on. I had family, I had friends who supported me, um, and that's how I got to where I am today. Indeed, and I, in fact, Julian Richer, of, you know, founded Richer Sounds, yeah. who I've met on a few occasions and interviewed, that's, you know, one of the key points he always makes. To create the situation, you've relied on everything else, the roads and the education and the healthcare system. You know, it isn't just self-made. It's all of us mm. have made it, you know, but you, yeah, uh, you people yeah. have shown leadership to make these things happen. Yeah, absolutely. And you made the point earlier about, you know, workers create wealth in companies or create the outputs of companies. And that's very true. It's not just, you know, the person with capital that invested in the company that makes that. You take the workers away and suddenly that firm's not doing very well, as, you know, as we're seeing with some of the public sector um, disputes at the moment. So how can we make this happen Oh, you know, you've you, you've got a good some good proposals there, you know, and and some, and some of them are not necessarily new, but I think you know the fact that the wealthy, to describe it as that, are actually proposing this. How can we really make it happen, and and you know bring this change about, and how can you know people contribute to making that happen? Mm. Well, at the end of the day, it has to be politicians, obviously, who who implement this. So I think we need to. What we're trying to do at the moment is keep the pressure up on politicians and you know they're in a bit of a difficult place at the moment because they need money frankly to pay for the decline of public services so i think we need to keep pressure on po politicians in this government and then you know there will be an election next year and we have to give again pressure and permission to parties to stand on a, a platform of creating more equality in society and wealth taxes being a key part of that, I think. It's political pressure. I think the public support is there, frankly. Not, often I would be arguing we need to get public support, but public support is in play. So it's a, is it a question of educating people more, you know, politicians and indeed voters, that this is a reality and it could happen if you supported it? I think it's uh, certainly with education, it, with, sorry, with politicians, I think certainly education pressure and permission i think permission is important so 
you know, what we're trying to do now and over the next 18 months is, if you like, do some of the heavy lifting in terms of making this more public, getting it on the agenda and so on, so that it becomes something that politicians don't hide away in a corner at the next election. And it, we're trying to get it on the public agenda from that way. As I say, in terms of public support, from the polling we did, the public would support a wealth tax. I think we do need probably to do something around the reassurance bit that actually we are aiming this at the super wealthy. This is not something that's going to hit you know, the top 50% of society or something. This is aimed at people with four million pounds or more, whatever, levels of wealth. That's the top 1%. So, yeah, so I think it's politicians, it's pressure, it's permission. And then with the public, it's you know, clarity of message, if you like, in what we're arguing for. So what particular th- initiatives do you have in your campaign planned over the next 12, 18 months then? Well, we're doing a lot within Parliament. Um, again, we're um, looking at all party parliamentary groups and trying to s- keep that debate stimulated within Parliament. And then externally, it's really the public events like Davos, which was great in terms of media attention and getting the media to, to focus on the issue and publish it. So it's a, it's a combination of, that, of those two, I think. So in terms of parliament, politicians, then it's within the system. And also, you know, obviously the public events like that will keep it in their, in their attention and hopefully will emphasise this message that says, you know, actually, as a group of wealthy people, we would like you to tax us more. So in some ways, a very difficult message for them to refuse. And then looking outwards, say it's the public, it's the press, the media, generally getting those messages out there um, that you know a wealth tax is going to be good for the country and we can rebuild our social fabric, we can rebuild the social contract, we can do all those good things that people are proud of in this country or have been proud of in this country and that this can make a difference to people's lives in a positive way. And that's what the debate should be about. Indeed, and I mean, one of the groups that... I help to run is com- compassion in politics. So certainly, you know, we- a wealth tax to me seems much more compassionate because it doesn't cause hardship. But putting up national insurance or in- tax in- income, ta- income tax or council tax on people who've got no money is definitely not compassionate. I know, and we, we continue to, you know, hammer people who are working hard for a living, really struggling with the cost of living, you know, and rising energy prices, food prices are rising faster than general inflation as well. And these are things that hit people at the bottom end of that, that income and wealth, wealth ladder. And we need to do something about that and say, wealth taxes on the super wealthy do not, do not harm anybody at the end of the day. We can, we can afford this stuff. What we can't afford is for people to be going hungry and kids to be growing hungry and creating a whole future generations problem around this, where you know we've got we end up with a, a generation that's resentful that they've been left behind, and you know we see the results of that already today in very divisive politics, very aggressive politics in many ways. So you know let's bring the country together and the compassion in politics absolutely, but let's bring the country together, get the social contract back in place and strive for a common objective around here. And let's, let's talk about that in politics. Let's not just talk about how we take a halfpenny off income tax or whatever. Absolutely, Phil. And I thank you very much for giving us that insight and giving us some hope. <laughs> and I hope that you, uh, you're successful in your task and certainly I will be uh, supporting what you're doing. I think it's particularly great. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Excellent. Nice to talk to you. So as Phil explained, this is not about taxes, but about decent public services and how we, can pay, how we pay for them. Why do we still take taxes on income from people who are struggling to pay for the basic necessities and as a result would have even less? It's just madness. It causes even more problems for those concerned and for the country as a whole. In my book, which was called From Here to Prosperity, I showed that we could take 80% of people out of paying any income tax by having tax on the assets of the super wealthy. And as Phil said, there is no such thing as a self-made man or woman as we all rely on state-funded education, health services, roads, rail, defence, law and order and support services. And they're all paid for out of the public purse. 
And that's a view also held by Julian Richer, founder of Richer Sounds, a home entertainment relay, retailer. And Julian has appeared many times on this podcast series and has done great work by initiating the campaign groups Tax Watch, Zero Hours Justice, Good Business Charter and the Fairness Foundation. So our mindset needs to change as those with wealth have some of the wealth that we all help to create because it's only accumulated by a few. So therefore, it's only fair that this few give some of that back, which is indeed what the patriotic millionaires are proposing. Now, if you'd like to find out more about the patriotic millionaires or indeed get involved directly, look up patrioticmillionaires.co, sorry, patrioticmillionaires.uk. So what do you think? Do contact us at info at realagendaradio.org or Twitter at realagendanet and via our website, realagendaradio.org. We'd love to hear your views. And if you'd like a copy of my book, From Here to Prosperity, A New Political Agenda, A Sustainable Economy and Greater Social Justice, go to fromheretoprosperity.org or to any good booksellers. You can also follow me, Tom Burgess, on Instagram, which is tomburgess2709, where I post info-related Real Agenda Radio and the campaigning work that I'm involved with. For more information, yes, indeed, realagendaradio.org, that's our website. You can listen and subscribe free to Real Agenda Radio on Amazon, Apple Podcasts. You can listen and subscribe free to Real Agenda Radio on Amazon, Apple Podcasts, Google and Spotify and more where you'll find a range of podcasts for political change. We know that we can achieve change if we work together. So that's what we're doing on Real Agenda Radio. The campaign groups and think tanks whose podcasts we distribute has a collective online following of nearly a million. Our challenge is to make sure they all listen to Real Agenda Radio. And recent shows have included Network News, this is an update on campaigns that seek to bring greater economic and social justice, Tax Cast from the Tax Justice Network, It's Bloody Complicated from Compass, podcast from Shepard Warwin, the publishers of the Ethical Economic series of books, and Across the Benches for Compassion in Politics. Real Agenda Radio, we... Real Agenda... At Real Agenda Radio, we aim to inform, inspire and involve those of you who want a more democratic, inclusive and fairer society that respects human rights and protects the planet. A special thanks to our sponsors, the Reverse Media Group, one of the world's fastest growing search and media companies. Find out why at reversemediagroup.com. Now one thing is certain, people want to see change for a more compassionate and just society, as well as more courageous politicians prepared to do the right thing for people over party. It's not happening, but it can. It's urgent and it's up to us to make it happen. Because that's the real agenda. I'm Tom Burgess, thank you for listening and I look forward to talking to you again soon.